from the College by the Lake, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Local, regional, national, and international guests discussing the issues and topics affecting the way you live are on Forum, the North Idaho College Public Forum, with your host and moderator, political scientist, Tony Stewart. Welcome to the North Idaho College Public Forum. For our viewers who were not with us last week, we started a two-week series which we will conclude today on the issue of water quality. In the first program, we talked about that issue in a very general way and about what's happening around the country and, and emphasized North Idaho. And we looked at particularly the quality of water in lakes and in streams. And it was a most informative program and we were grateful to the representatives from the state of Idaho's uh, division of uh, environmental quality who came on the program. We have two representatives back from that division uh, today. Uh, first of all, I'd welcome to the program John Sutherland, who is the rem remediation supervisor for the DEQ. And next to him is Steve Tanner, who is the drinking water supervisor. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. We uh, certainly enjoyed your colleagues last week. And this week, we want to give a little bit different emphasis to this very important question of water quality. We'd like to talk about uh, systems that we don't see very uh, much, and that is aquifers around the country and what they do to providing water to residents and to commercial establishments and industry and so forth. And we'd also like to talk with one of our guests today about uh, drinking water, which is something everyone has to have. And based on that uh, brief introduction, we shall proceed. Uh, John, my first question would be to you. Many laypersons who are not involved in the way you are in uh, looking at ecosystems, and in this case water, uh, may not be as cognizant as they should be of what we mean by from the time water comes down or it rains, uh, what happens. So if you take us through that and particularly identify aquifers, we'd be appreciative. Well, Tony, I think you, you hit, hit on part of the answer right, right in your introduction there when you talked about an unseen resource. I think we could consider groundwater to be a hidden resource. When it rains outside, what happens is the rain oftentimes runs over the surface of the land, ends up in streams and rivers and lakes. Some of it ends up evaporating and others ends up being up, uptake by plant. What's left over that doesn't end up in the, the lakes, streams, or rivers ends up going down, seeping very slowly down through the ground. As it seeps down through the ground, it moves through what we call the unsaturated zone. And that is a zone that's got some water and air and in, in the upper level some different microorganisms. As it moves down, it keeps slowly migrating down and it comes to what we call the saturated zone or the water table. The saturated zone is an area down below the Earth's surface where the entire porosity or the, the space between the soils or the cracks in the rocks, whatever the underground geology may be, is completely filled with water. And so it would be appropriate to describe that too as like a, just a major underground river? I think in some cases we could certainly describe it as, as an underground river. In some topographies you've got uh, actually what they call karst topography or limestone that actually does flow like rivers. Uh, in other areas the aquifers are do tend to move like underground rivers, but they move extremely, extremely slowly compared to the surface water resources that we're used to, to looking at. Um, in some cases, I think it's important though to realize that the groundwater does move. It, it both fluctuates up and down, and it also does move laterally or horizontally. So if you looked around this, the planet and, and you drill in different areas, you won't, you won't find it in the same a form or structure uh, from one, say, aquifer to another? There, there are many, many different types of aquifers that uh, we can encounter. Some of them we could call a water table type aquifer, which is what we have with the Raft and Prairie. Essentially what that is, is it's, it's under the same pressure as the land surface. There, essentially there is sands and gravels or an open structure all the way from the ground surface down to the water table. You can have other types of, uh, of water systems that we call confined aquifers that are actually under pressure, squeezed between two layers of, of a relatively impermeable uh, or 
uh, and a very tight water bearing formation that doesn't allow the water to move through them and they can actually be under pressure. If we drill into one of those confined aquifers and the pressure is high enough, we get what, what is known as a flowing artesian well. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, if we flow into a water table, if we drill into a water table aquifer, what we end up with is just the water is at the level that we hit it at. It is not under pressure. So it depends on the type of soil and, and the rock formation and so forth, what one finds from place to place. C may I assume, that, like uh, uh, the exploring for petroleum and so forth, that it's much deeper to tap in some localities than others? Yes, and even the same aquifer can be much deeper in some areas than others. Uh, the Rathen Prairie Aquifer, for instance, has some areas where you can drill down 20 feet over in the Spokane area and hit water. In fact, it eventually flows out on the ground surface in springs to the Little Spokane River. When we get up north of the Athol area, it's almost 400 feet to groundwater, so certainly that is the case. Right. Let's talk a little bit about the Rathdrum Aquifer. It's, uh, for our area, it's really well known and, and a very precious uh, source of, of water. How does it compare in uh, volume and uh, and use any and quality with other aquifers in say the United States or Canada? Well, I'm very happy to say that it, it compares favorably with most of the aquifers in the country. In fact, it may be one of the most, the best aquifers as far as the water bearing capabilities that it has. If we take a look at the Rathen Prairie Aquifer, we can look at it, we can describe the aquifer in sev several different ways. We talk about the porosity or the, the ability of that aquifer to hold water, and we talk about the permeability or the ability of that aquifer to pass water through it. This is an extremely, extremely permeable aquifer, and we have water velocities up to 50 to even 90 feet a day in this aquifer. That's almost unheard of in a water table aquifer. The Water quality is generally excellent. We, except for a very few instances, most of the water quality in the Rathen Prairie exceeds all of the drinking water standards that have been established by the federal government to protect uh, public health. And as far as volume goes, it is an extremely, extremely very I'm, I'm trying to think of the right word here. It, we have a huge amount of water available. Essentially what we're looking at when we look at the state line where the water funnels down and passes from Idaho into Washington is about 750 cubic feet a second or about 500 million gallons a day that, it, that passes between Idaho and Washington at the state line. So that is really good news for this area to that we do have a great water supply that's much greater than other, some localities where the population would be similar. Oh, we have an excellent water supply, you bet. Let's talk a little bit about how we protect that because when you look at the rivers and uh, the lakes, we can see if there is a deterioration much easier because it's above ground, it's visible, or uh, some small lakes, what happens that you can see growing in, in the lake and, and what's happening to the, to the life in that lake under a hidden system like this, deterioration could happen. I know it's the responsibility of you and others to do some monitoring and all, but what are the greatest dangers of uh, polluting uh, aquifers such as the Rathen pr Prairie without even uh, knowing? And I, and I again want to repeat that I know you people will be watching that, but for the general public, they could be unaware. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, in some years past when there was talking about construction on the Rathen Prairie and, and using septic tanks and so forth, not having the sewer system. Uh, just, John, give us a little bit of elaboration. Two points. One, how do you keep monitoring to protect that great water system? And two, what's the greatest danger to it? The greatest danger to it, I think, we can speak very generally to, and that's, that's surface land use activities. That, in other words, activities that take place on the ground surface that have some kind of a discharge of wastewater or waste product or spills or accidental releases that may potentially affect the water quality below. What you have to do with any aquifer, including the Rathen Prairie Aquifer, is you have to understand what sort of geology you have between the ground surface and the water table itself. In this particular case, we have extremely coarse sands and gravels that offer extremely limited protection to the 
water that we're all using for our drinking water supply down below. So when we start to evaluate this, we, we have to take a look at all of the activities that are taking place on the ground surface that may potentially affect the groundwater. Some of those may be the placement of underground storage tanks that uh, oh, may have gone in 20 or 30 years ago and most of the data indicates that they've got about an 18 year lifespan. If we don't take a look at these, they can start to leak and they may cause contamination of the Rathdrum Prairie. Some of the original data that was collected on the Rathdrum Prairie Aquifer dealt with septic tanks and drain fields. And that was some early work done under a federal 208 program uh, that was Section 208 of the, of the Clean Water Act where the Panhandle Health District in Spokane County actually took a look at the effects of some of the, the septic systems on the Rathdrum Prairie Aquifer. And while the determination was that the, the water quality was excellent, they could see trends down, downstream of concentrations of subsurface sewage disposal systems. So we knew that there was an impact on these from these type of disposal systems on the resource. So by that continuing to happen, just like a lake or a river, it is possible for deterioration to reach the point to where there would be such destruction that uh, it would be very serious to the water quality or the future use of an aquifer? One of the things, Tony, when you take a look at, at disposing of any kind of waste stream into a river, we have something that flows very, fairly quickly. We have uh, the, the, the contaminant disperses quickly and it, there is a, a fairly large dis dilution factor. When we take a look at an aquifer that is, that is relatively slow moving, even though this is one of the fastest in the country, it's relatively slow moving compared to rivers, what we see is there's very little turbulence down there and very little dilution and dispersion of the contaminant so it can actually travel in plumes down there. It is extremely, extremely difficult to pull that, to pull a contaminant back out of the, the, the groundwater once it's reached there. So yes, you can essentially destroy an aquifer by not taking responsibility for waste that's generated or not, not being aware of the contaminants that are going into it. Thank you. Steve, that brings us to the question that John has just been eloquent in, in discussing what this whole process is, but you and your job at uh, the Division of uh, Environmental Quality for the state of Idaho, deals, you deal very specifically with people's drinking water. And we talked on the other show about a law that was passed called the Safe Drinking Water Act of the federal government. Let's start with talking about some of the standards. What are some of the requirements to maintain a safe level for each uh, person's drinking water? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> why don't I give you a little bit of background Please. first, Tony. The, uh, uh, a lot of people uh, take their drinking water for granted and they assume it's going to be safe and they assume that people are watching over it, um, such as our agency. The um, um, first federal standards for uh, protecting drinking water were adopted uh, by Congress in 1974 and that was referred to as the Safe Drinking Water Act. Uh, when Congress uh, adopted the act, they had uh, essentially directed the uh, Environmental Protection Agency to develop standards uh, for contaminants in drinking water, certain monitoring requirements to test for certain contaminants. The uh, uh, the US EPA adopted these standards and then uh, they always give the states in the United States the ability to regulate their own water supplies in the state and in 1978 is when Idaho actually wrote their own regulations. They have to write uh, standards that are the as strict, you might say, as the federal standards. But they could even make them more strict if they chose. They, they can, exactly. Idaho typically uh, adopts uh, the, the same standards as the federal government does. Uh, Idaho adopted theirs in their first standards in 1978. At that time we were uh, regulating or overseeing about 22 contaminants in drinking water and it wasn't until 1986 that uh, Congress amended that original act and actually required that EPA start regulating uh, up to 83 contaminants in drinking water. Um, our department has been in the process of revising our standards or requirements uh, to conform with these federal standards and it's, it's required a lot more monitoring of water systems and uh, frankly many of these new standards were actually needed because the, the old standards there were still people being exposed to chemicals such as industrial chemicals, man-made chemicals uh, like pesticides that 
uh, there were no standards for. We knew they weren't healthy to be exposed to, but uh, many of these were needed. Um, another example of a, a contaminant that was not uh, regulated uh, with the initial act was um, um, Giardia, which is a, a microbiological contaminant that uh, it's not a man-caused thing. It essentially occurs um, naturally. Wildlife can carry it. Uh, they can transmit it even in uh, some of the most pristine water supplies uh, in watersheds. And, and many of these uh, uh, water systems in North Idaho that use surface water as their uh, sole source of drinking water did not have the treatment capabilities to take Giardia out. And so I hear you saying that uh, from all the different kind of things that can happen, at, at one time a water system can be quite uh, high quality and deteriorate very quickly but from one of these uh, contaminants that maybe not be as easy to manage if you don't continue to monitor. Yeah, exactly. The, the whole premise behind the Safe Drinking Water Act and the state's uh, regulation of drinking water is uh, to require water systems to do periodic sampling for various types of contaminants. And if these things are found, uh, that the public be notified so they can at least uh, take preventative measures. If it, it might be boiling water, it might be uh, getting water from another source if boiling is ineffective and making it safe. So with that constant uh, supervision, you can possibly prevent some real health problems of the general public. That's, that's the whole basis behind it is uh, to prevent illnesses from occurring um, by doing the monitoring, by notifying the people if there's a problem. The, um, it, it's much uh, easier to uh, uh, prevent uh, illnesses from occurring and much cheaper uh, in the long run. The, uh, and this is what it's, it's hard for some people to understand is they've been drinking certain waters for years and years and, and they may have not gotten sick, uh, but oftentimes uh, the people that are most sensitive are going to be the ones that are not healthy to begin with. They may have medical disorders that causes their immune systems to not be as healthy. So they're not a healthy person and they have medical costs and so forth if, if they reach a certain point. Also, uh, isn't another reason for all your work in water quality and other agencies around the country is that certain pollutants could be of the level of a toxic danger to where it could also be terminal, that is, that, this, that certain diseases could arise. Um, there's been a lot of studies done suggesting that it could cause death in some cases. So. That's uh, correct. Uh, we usually classify contaminants into two categories, one being acute contaminants that can uh, cause uh, illnesses over a very quick period of time, uh, giardia. Uh, most of the microbiological contaminants are, are that way. There's some chemicals that are. Many of the chemical contaminants, though, are felt to be chronic uh, health problems where by being exposed to these contaminants over years and years, they can actually uh, increase the risk of cancer. Mm -hmm. Another, another thing that you talked to me about the other day when we met that I was very impressed with is that people need to know where their water is coming from mm -hmm. and where it goes, at the disposal. And a lot of people who, if they live in urban areas, of course, they're on a water system where it's monitored much closer and certain treatments and preventive. But a lot of people live in the rural areas, particularly here in Idaho, in which they, they're on a system that's not tied to any uh, community's water system. And mm -hmm. would you address how? they should look at their system and be concerned and what could happen. In a moment, we'll have our staff to put a telephone number up on the screen too and contact your office. Mm -hmm. But let's first talk about how that you can help them. Sure. Making some suggestions to them about identifying where the water comes from and looking at its quality. Yeah. Idaho, our regulations only regulate or only uh, oversee uh, water systems that either serve 15 service connections or 25 people. Um, 60 days out of the year and so you can see that leaves a lot of water systems uh, totally um, unregulated. Uh, the, um, uh, we, we deal a lot with um, non-public water systems and so does the Panhandle Health District. In fact, the, the drinking water program in, in North Idaho, we regulate, uh, oversee about a little over 500 water systems and these systems are split between our agency and the Panhandle Health District. We typically handle the larger systems. Uh, what uh, um, uh, individuals, whether they're on a public system or a non-public system, uh, they should find out where their water system or their water source comes from, and how it's delivered to them, how it's stored, what type of reservoirs, and and uh, the general public is usually not familiar with that. All they know is really that water comes out of the tap, and the only time they're 
oftentimes concerned is when uh, there is no water coming out of the tap or perhaps they may be notified uh, that it's unsafe and to boil it but we really encourage people to get a hold of their water purveyor whether it be the city of Coeur d'Alene or um, a small water association and find out whether if they have wells where the water is pumped from if they have a surface water treatment plant to see how that water is actually uh, treated to make it safe uh, private individuals uh, that uh, uh, if they want to have their water tested, they can contact our agency, they can contact one of the local health district offices and get guidance on what type of testing would be best to do. We have a regional laboratory in Coeur d'Alene here that uh, can actually uh, do many of the tests. There are some private labs too in North Idaho. Let's pause here to give them the telephone number. Uh, if, they're, if they're local, they just have to call this number. It's gone up on the screen now and I see, and if they're out of a certain area, they'd call area code 208. 769-1422 uh, and then you could share some information with them and that's one of the purposes of this program is to help people know who to contact. Uh, one of the question for you Steve before we go back to John and you'd indicate to me that if we do certain preventive measures and you alluded to that a moment ago just mm -hmm. uh, briefly we can prevent great costs later and we're always short of money with the, with our deficit spending and so forth in our country. Um, would you address that question, uh, the difference between preventive measures now and having to deal with it when it's a great problem? Yeah. Um, I, I think one of the um, areas that we've seen where uh, water supplies in the Northwest have been impacted by contamination um, might be a situation where a community has a, uh, an outbreak of Giardia, which is an intestinal parasite that can cause uh, severe illnesses in certain individuals that are affected. Uh, I've investigated a number of these outbreaks and I've, I've looked at uh, many other outbreaks that have occurred and, and typically where the costs are, uh, oftentimes this illness is not fatal. Um, there are certain parasites that we're finding in drinking water that, that can be fatal for people that are uh, perhaps have immune disorders and those people need to really be uh, concerned about uh, contaminants from improperly treated surface water but uh, where the costs typically come in are um, uh, the medical cost to get treated, uh, the medical cost to actually get diagnosed and oftentimes these illnesses uh, don't always get attributed to drinking water unless you have a, a large number of people in the community getting ill. They can also have a big financial impact on the economy of the area. If a, if a, a community, a, a city perhaps, uh, develops a reputation that the water is not safe there, um, and I think we've all are aware that in Mexico that it's not felt that you should drink the water there without first treating it, but um, that can be a, an enormous uh, stigma on a community um, that's trying to promote tourism, um, things like that. The also, when, when people get ill, um, they are not able to work, they may be staying home, that takes away from um, the economy. Uh, Isn't another you know? factor too though, if, if a system became seriously contaminated, the water system might be uh, imported from a greater distance which would be uh, passed on to the homeowner. Well, yeah, I exactly. The, um, it usually requires uh, hauling in uh, bottled water. Um, in, in some instances, um, people are um, you know, I think the, they're definitely inconvenienced when something like that occurs. Uh, the amount of resources that gets spent on dealing with an outbreak uh, are, can be enormous from our department standpoint, the water utilities, and it's just so much easier to prevent this type of thing from occurring because we know how to prevent it. And, uh, and that's the whole basis behind this uh, program. On the positive note, uh, when we compare the quality of our drinking water here with some other parts of the country that are older systems, I'm thinking of cities where ju just, just simple things like uh, the, the water lines and so forth that are very old in cities like New York compared with Houston, which is a younger city, uh, just the breaks and the cost of repairs and replacements. Mm -hmm. Based on that, uh, we being a, a, a young uh, settled area compared with some of those areas, is the, is the drinking water generally of much higher quality here than it is in some other parts of the country? Well, it, we're, I think we generally have higher drinking water quality um, when you talk about chemical contamination. Uh, okay. We are a, a younger part of the country and we haven't had the heavy industry in here that really um, by using improper disposal practices have, uh, have ruined a lot of our surface water and groundwater without treatment for drinking water. 
The uh, uh, oftentimes, though, the we have a lot of very clear water, very clean water, and that tends to give people the false security that uh, this water's got to be safe because it's clean. But uh, there are uh, a lot of microbiological contaminants that uh, can get in there, and if the water's not properly treated, it's it's not safe to drink. John, when we were meeting again the other day with all of you before we did the programs, I was also impressed with uh, one of the members of, of your staff that could not be with us today, and I'd like you to address the question that she was addressing. That is, at the Division of Environmental Quality, you're kind of in a balancing act. There are certain responsibilities and roles that you do not play. It's not your jurisdiction. That is, as we grow, and we are really a growing area, and we deal with planning and zoning and, and requiring certain um, provisions for development. Uh, that happens in another entity of government, and then you come along and take a look at the water quality. How do you work with other agencies and with the citizenry in general in this delicate balance that you're in, and maintaining high quality water but still not making certain decisions that affect that water? We work in a supportive role primarily, uh, technical assistance. We also provide financial assistance. And I think, Tony, I, I want to jump back to the previous question and blend sure. it back into this one. I think when we take a look at prevention of water quality, there's some other aspects other than disease pre prevention. And I think if we take a look at a situation where we can put control measures on the ground surface, for example, uh, secondary containment of dangerous materials so they do not enter a well, or providing best management practices for agricultural chemicals, or provide treatment or application rates for land application systems so they do not contaminate the, the groundwater below, I think it's very important to take a look at those as cost-saving measures. Because if we look down the road and we allow solvents or gasoline to get into a well, basically the owners have, have three choices. They're going to look at, number one, cleaning up the groundwater down below, which we've already discussed is extremely expensive. They're going to look at hooking into another water system or developing another water system and bringing water in. or they're going to look at s another alternative to supply water, which is which usually pretty expensive. So if we can get up front and prevent the contamination, then in essence we have actually saved the community money. So, and what, what we call that, or what I equate a lot of that to, is planning. If we take a look at preventing of contamination, we're actually planning for, for the, the health and well-being of our community. On that note, after bringing the program to conclusion, I want to thank both of you. wish we had more time to discuss what is a very important issue, and that is the quality of our water that we use, and, uh, and it's obviously essential to the well-being of our citizenry. Ladies and gentlemen, with this, we conclude a two-week series on the issue of water quality, and I'd like to invite you to be with us again next week when we switch to a different topic. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. The North Idaho College Public Forum was videotaped live from the studios of Telemedia Services on the campus of North Idaho College for viewing at this more appropriate time. We invite you to join us again next week for another all-new edition of the North Idaho College Public Forum on this public television station.